Welcome to the 21st video of um, the Just In Case series sponsored by Quality and Equality, an OD consultancy firm based in Oxford, United Kingdom. And my name is Mayan Cheung Judge, and I'm the founder and director of Q&E. Um, we call this series Just In Case, just in case you need to be reminded of something, just in case you didn't know something, just in case you need refreshing um, of some sub topic that you learned long time ago, or just in case you want to learn something new. And today is my privilege to welcome to the video a wonderful contributor, Dr. and Professor Kathy Royal. So Dr. Royal developed many interesting theory, including the quadrant behavioral theory, um, to help us to understand particularly how to see behavior that create and sustain uh, exclusion in society and system. Um, she served as a faculty member with Colorado Technical University. She has worked in the field of structural inequality, diversity, social justice for more than 30 years and has been recognized by representative of the Congress for her work on gender empowerment. And of course, she has, as a social justice advocate for over so many years, uh, since the civil disobedience in 1960, Kathy used her life experience in her work as a behavioral scientist, educator, and OD practitioner. And her subject matter expertise uh, in leadership development system, thinking, social justice, and appreciative inquiry. She's a member of the Emeritus of NTL Institute and also an adjunct faculty of um, Colorado Technical University. And you will be amazed and your eyes will open by what Kathy will be teaching us. And so be ready to be provoked and to be um, evoke into thinking what is our responsibility to see people and hear people and to work with them to build a much more inclusive society. So Kathy, thank you for your investment of your time and effort. And um, may I turn the time over to you? I'd like to start by thanking everyone for taking the opportunity to um, look at me and hear what I have to say. I am, as uh, you know, an African-American woman. I'm an OD practitioner, and I'm very dedicated to social justice. Oftentimes, I will tell my clients and my students, because I'm also a professor, that it is not just my vocation, it is my advocation. It is a lifelong journey. Part of that journey is knowing that everywhere I go, all day and any day, when I walk into a room, people make a decision about what they see first. Do they see a black person first or do they see a woman first? But what I'm very clear about is that they see a black woman. And all of the messages that the culture, any culture, sends to all of us about what that means in terms of status, in terms of authority, in terms of uh, respectability, in terms of hiring processes, uh, in terms of leadership. So my perspective is that from understanding how the world sees me, which is often very different than how I see myself. And so it's important for me to talk to OD practitioners and to talk to my mentees, my students, about why social justice is so critical. This is such a pivotal time for us now because we have an opportunity to do something different. We have an opportunity to reseed the garden of the world, to actually think about humanity in another way. We need new seeds. And I know as an African-American woman that that is such fertile territory right now. This is an opportunity and I want to add my voice to it. I don't want us to miss this.
I would be more than happy to talk about structural inequality for our community. I think one of the things about our discussions of structural inequality is that when we think about resistance to change, we also think about the opportunity to find more than one avenue to an issue. To say, well, yeah, but, or so-and-so, or so-and-so says it's this, or um, Dr. Johnson says it's this. Well, I would ask us to begin to think about looking at working definitions. And the reason why I want to think about working definitions is because when we use something consistently, we have the opportunity to be the scientists that we all can be. And when I think about structural inequality, it is the system, the structures, the policies, the practices, the learned behaviors, the historical perspective, the academic in institutions of how we teach and behave. It is the assumptions of who and what we have in terms of power or privilege. Structural inequality is the umbrella of all of the ways that we look at oppression. It includes racism, sexism, heterosexism, and ageism, and people with ability differences. We think about this as the structure in which we live. We built all our systems based on this structure. And we make policy decisions in our system from the understanding of the structure. The structural equality is where we want to be. The structural inequality is where we are at our current stance. And so we have to look at what's there. Anytime you think of yourself as solving a problem, one of the things we know about the diagnosis is that you have to have accurate information and you have to be able to look at what is there in order to diagnose it accurately. And structural inequality is one of the significant places in our lives today where we choose to look away from what's there and create perfectly logical explanations as to why it's something other than the inequality that lives in our culture, in our systems, and in our understanding of self. The joy of understanding something is then to be able to be clear about how you can change it. So there's always hope. One of the things about being an African-American woman and being the daughter, well, being the great, great granddaughter of slaves, of an enslaved African, and also the great, great granddaughter of a slaveholder who was a United States senator, Senator Tate out of Alabama, and I can trace my roots in that way. I have the receipt of sale for my great, great grandfather. And so how could I not be hopeful? How could I not think about the idea of things can change? How can I not be the spiritual woman that I am, the African-American woman that I am, the teacher, the mentor, the mother, the daughter, without believing in hope. And so hope really is one of the things that has guided me, um, allowed me to become a theorist, to really think about what we can do and why. One of the things I know about hope is that we have to keep at it. We have to keep hope in front of our vision of where we want to go. Well, actually, I'm asking them to do a couple of things. I'm asking them to use definitions that allow them to be able to track and identify and name isms in a system. And that's something that has been lost to us. And so as I did my work, as I did my dissertation work, and as I did other work in the world around this as a person who um, grew up as the daughter of a civil rights activist, 
I began to look at what was going on. And as someone who is a behavioral scientist and an OD practitioner, I took the theories that we have and began to look at them and say, what's missing from this theoretical framework? So, you know, OD practitioners uh, love to work in boxes. We love to work in squares. We have all kinds of quadrants that we talk about, unconscious consciousness, conscious consciousness, and so on. We have the Johari window. And we had quadrants where we had discussions about racism and sexism in the 60s and in the 90s. But something was missing because we always found ourselves either stuck or the rate of recidivism returning to our old behavior has been very high. So as I asked young people, as I asked my colleagues, actually, what is it that you see that you would like to have differently? So I began to think about that. And my theory called quadrant behavior theory is one of the areas and one of the theoretical frameworks that we can use. Quadrant behavior theory is a platform theory. What I mean by platform theory, we can use it at any of our other theoretical frames. We can use it in appreciative inquiry. I know exactly where to locate it. We can use it in strategic planning. We can certainly use it in leadership development. We can use it in uh, dismantling racism and sexism in a system. Quadrant behavior theory is a theory that looks at structural inequality through the lens of understanding the isms that are currently present. And so if I were asking young people to uh, search for the systemic issues that they would want to dismantle, there are two things that I would say to them. Number one, in your searching, always hold in your mind the hope for change and the vision of why you're searching. Are you searching to continue a fight or are you searching to change behavior? And so the theory of quadrant behavior theory is in the expectation that once you see it, you will change your behavior. The answer is yes, it is my theory. Um, it was developed over time when I was a graduate student at Fielding University, and my mentor was Charlie Seashore, and he and I were doing uh, diversity work in systems, and quite frankly, uh, Miyoung, it was very painful. Many times I would be the dean of a lab, or I would be the person who had the deeper knowledge, around uh, diversity and equity and inequality. And Charlie would be the one that everyone always defaulted to. And so as we were having conversations about this default, it became uh, a conversation that I had. I said, it's very interesting to me that the default is always to the white man. And so we started talking about that. I was working with um, other NTL, National Training Laboratory, um, Institute for Applied Behavioral Science Practitioners, and the late Robert Moore. And so as we did that work, and we looked at the work of Elsie Y. Cross and her quadrants, where Elsie would ask people to go into individual quadrants, meaning white male, white female, men of color, and women of color. And actually, to be very transparent about it, in the late 60s and early 70s, it was white men, white women, black men, black women. And rarely did anyone put the configuration together. That's where my work joins others' work. And you know, Mian, they say to you to create new knowledge in the field. And so looking at what was currently present and also looking at what was needed to happen next is where I began to talk about quadrant behavior theory as looking at the Northern Hemisphere, which is white men and white women, and the Southern Hemisphere, which is men of color and women of color. Then I decided that we had to pay attention to how they were even positioned on, quote unquote, the cultural board. 
And the cultural board is present all over the world. And one of the things I say in quadrant behavior theory is that the board is always in play. So as an OD practitioner, as a, as a human behaviorist, as a theorist, as a black woman, one of the things I was painfully aware of and then in some ways curious about is why do these things continue to happen? So at that point, I began to put a valence of power and privilege to each quadrant, to each individual in the quadrants. And we began to talk about what does it mean to be in the top quadrant? What does it mean to be in the top hemisphere? What does it mean to be in the Southern hemisphere? And quite frankly, there are so many dynamics that play out until this lecture is to talk about, yes, I can. This lecture is to talk about why we should, and this lecture is to talk about what next. Yes, I can teach others quadrant behavior theory. In, in actuality, that is what I want to leave as my legacy, as a significant change process. Why should we do it? Because it gives us a roadmap to use of self, it gives us a roadmap to understanding group dynamics, and it gives us a roadmap to understanding how one individual as a group member, owning that group identity, then begins to create systemic resistance or systemic discrimination. And over long periods of time, it becomes the structure. So much so into all of us who are in it, resist anyone telling us that it's there. So yes, I can. In quadrant behavior theory, two things are expected. One is that, and I'll use an African proverb um, to emphasize the, the first thing. And when I am doing rites of passage with young women who are about to be, join the mysteries and joys of being women in the world, one of the things I say to them is, she who knows does not live like she who does not know. And now you know, so you will live differently. And what I mean by that is quadrant behavior theory has a functionality to it. And it is distinguishing behavior is a function of a willingness to change, a contact with the other, and a awareness of what must happen next. So it's really D, C, A equals distinguishing behavior. And what I mean by D is a decision to change. We all have to make that decision because if we don't, then we find ourselves being very frustrated by people telling us, well, that's just so white of you, or that's just like a man. So how do I want to be different? That's the use of self. That's my internal decision. And then what has to happen is what we talk about in many of our other theoretical frameworks. In order to change, you have to have contact with the other because you can't continue to diagnose from the same framework. And so that contact with the other, for me, is that beautiful space in Johari window where it is you don't know what you don't know until you engage with the others. And that's where we're going to co-create our preferred future. And when you are in contact with the other, that's where the new awareness shows up. Because in order to do that, you also have to be in a place of trust. So that's where you use Louise Diamond's work, and that's my model around uh, Dr. Diamond said when she was working in some really intractable situations around the world, the first level of trust is, I trust you will do me no harm. And I trust you will be interested in my interest is the second level. And I'm gonna pause there for a moment because I really wanna speak from my heart around what that means for a black woman in the world to enter into a into, into an arena, into, into the territory, as I call it, with an open heart that I trust you will do me no harm. 
That has not been the experience. The experience is that the organization is hostile, the culture is hostile, the educational environment is hostile. So to walk in the world in a trusting way, using my theory to behave in a different manner, to join at a contact level with others is absolute good trouble, as John Lewis would say. But it is also an act of bravery. Because I never know where I'm going to meet someone who will join me on this journey or where I will meet the hostility that has been the historical story of Black people in the world and of people of color. So to step out of that, the theory was the most freeing thing I had because that allowed me to look at a system and actually be able to say, it's, it's just data. It's just data until I can give you some current and reliable feedback. And believe, hope, that when you take it in, you will change your behavior. Absolutely. And part of that is in, in, in the theory, in the trainings that we offer. But one of the things that we are so clear about, uh, particularly people who are historically excluded and currently targeted. So the immigrant community, the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender community, women, um, uh, people of color, Black people, all of those people live on the quadrant theory. And so at any point you would find a black person who is a woman, here comes me, who also is a woman with a disability, who also may be a woman who uh, speaks a second language or whose first language is something other than quote unquote United States English. So one of the things that the other, that contact base is with someone who has privilege and has power, unearned power, meaning just power by skin color and gender or the ability to speak, quote unquote, English as a first language, just to use those three, is the expectation that if that person has made a decision to change and is making contact in an authentic way, they will show up trustworthy, which is different than saying, trust me, because trust me has not worked very well for excluded and targeted people. But if you are distinguishing yourself from a group of people who have a history, a very uh, checkered history of being trustworthy, then your distinguishing behavior at the contact point is to show up trustworthy. Showing up trustworthy means to have some working knowledge of what my life is like and also working knowledge of what your life is like and how privilege plays in your life. And then the dialogue is different. And each person uh, has the capability, the authority and the agency to create authentic dialogue, but power must show up trustworthy. Power must ask other power people questions about their behavior. So that's another contact piece. And the, the, the one that I think is, um, the most imp the, the, the most impactful sometimes is to talk from that person, from a white male or a white female or a man of color, if we're talking about women of color, from an understanding of what that power can and has uh, given them in the world and how they would like to use it differently. So a very simple question of, you know, I'm here how can we partner? And I use partner um, because if I think about it from a business perspective, a partnership, both partners are in it in financial and you rise and fall on the behavior of your partner. An ally can take her resources and say, well, you know, we just had a storm and the roof is leaking. And so I'm not able to give you what I promised because I'm not in partnership. I'm an ally. Ally is more fluid for me than partner. 
So when I partner with someone uh, to look at social justice and to look at the power dynamic, the other question is, how can I use my power to facilitate a more equitable situation between me and you, between our groups, in our systems when we work together? And how can I show up differently? I'm here to listen. And my other tag phrase is, can you hear me now? Absolutely. Any system that we have, any system that we have right now, and so when, when we talk about systems thinking, all of our systems are in any form um, configurations of individuals. And so power individuals influence systems and people who are powered down um, react to that power. And so if I'm thinking about use of self and I have made a decision to uh, make contact and enhance my awareness, that is absolutely the first level of use of self. And I use myself to influence my system. I use myself, my power, and my privilege to listen with intent. And I use myself at every level of my system to say, when I am doing an analysis of racism, sexism, and other forms of structural inequality, I am going to change my behavior and I am going to talk to others who look like me, who have power like me, to influence them. So I'm not saying all power over is the power that you use, but if I'm using myself, I'm using my agency, I'm using my presence, I'm using my authority, and I'm using my resources. Everything begins with self in our cultures now, and then self joins with others, and we become group, and then we join with others, and we become uh, organizations or agencies or structures. And then when we look, we become a culture. And over long periods of time, it is self that shifts a system. And so to use myself, when I was reading the study that um, Myung and uh, David uh, released and we looked at the surveys, the whole notion I'm feeling better about myself when I feel like I've used myself to influence something. So use of self is a clear point of influence in quadrant behavior theory. Actually, it's dangerous. Uh, and it's definitely dangerous for impacted and targeted people. It's terribly dangerous when that awareness is absent um, or when the contact is unauthentic or inauthentic because then it is shooting in the dark. It is, well, I'm just going to do what I want to do because I think that's the best thing to do because I'm the boss of me. But the me that joins with the other, the, the me that joins with the other becomes the we. And so that whole conversation or whole conversation characteristic of listening with intent and listening to clearly hear the other. Um, one of the things we talk about in quadrant behavior theory is an internal empathic response. And that requires intentional listening. And it requires listening at the heart so that you do have an empathic response that is beyond a profit margin, that is beyond making sure that um, the, the group that looks like me, and I used to affectionately say that the 42 longs stay at the table. And you know that's a Brook Brothers size for what is expected to be the white male uh, leader. So, if you have an internal empathic response, your awareness is heightened. It gives you the opportunity to look around and see 
the world differently and to see your, your station in it differently. And I wanna say, I wanna be very clear that in quadrant behavior theory, no one is asking anyone to sell the fauna. That is not what this is about. It is about looking at how we can make a larger table for inclusion. We built the table in the beginning. We didn't say it had to be eight by 12. It could be nine by 11. We could make smaller chairs. There are all kinds of ways to have an awareness that then shifts um, the exclusion and the pain in our systems currently. I do. Um, at the level of engagement with leadership and as an OD practitioner, I would say that one of the things that is most important is A, to show up trustworthy, um, really look at what is the truth when you talk about your system and to be as transparent as possible about your goals for diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout your system, throughout your family, however and wherever you are doing that work, show up trustworthy, tell the truth, and be transparent. The other piece that I would say is anytime you find yourself saying, yeah, but, my suggestion is factor in a definition of racism and track that behavior. So racism for me is a system of inequality based on skin color privilege operated by whites over people of color, thereby limiting their people of color access to goods, opportunities, and services. A system of inequality based on prejudging and power exercised by whites over people of color, thereby limiting their access to goods, opportunities, and services. When you can categorize anything in a system as a good, an opportunity, and a service, and you can see the access blockage, then you have an opportunity to figure out how you want to use yourself to shift that behavior, shift that policy shift that discrimination. So use a tracking, decide to, to engage, and show up trustworthy. Tell the truth. I want you to remember this topic as a walk in faith by a Black woman. Faith that the beloved communities that I have will take, take up the mantle and really begin to change. And like I said to others who have listened, if you didn't want to change the world, you should not have called me. Thank you. On behalf of everyone, thank you, Kathy, for this power pack presentation the part that is sitting with me very, very acutely is when you describe your experience um, so vulnerably, so openly, why are you inviting all of us into your own self-reflection um, in order for us to work together towards a future of partnership. I'm so grateful for you taking time to share and share some elegantly and clearly about this very, very controversial topic that have lots of concepts that people always not pretend they don't understand, but it was hard for them to understand. But after watching your video, nobody can say they don't understand what structural inequality, what racism is, and what is about um, what we need to do in order to build that partnership. So. May I ask you all, the viewer, to contact Kathy to continue the conversation. Her email, together with all the resources, are uh, in the description at the end of the video. 
So, Kathy, a big thank you again to you for all your wisdom. And everybody keep well, keep safe, and um, work together to build a more fair and equitable world.